In this video we have some more tactics. We are going to go back to the Soviet-Afghan War of the 1980s. We are going to talk about Afghan Mujahideen area defense. The easiest way to describe it is the same as what was employed by the Imperial German Army late in World War I, 1917 into 1918, where you had strong points at critical locations, and then traveling between those strong points, you had highly maneuverable mobile forces that were well equipped that would maneuver to whatever area was needed to repel an enemy penetration. Now, some of the notes that I pulled from the book. The Mujahideen employed large numbers of well-camouflaged, deeply dug, artillery-proof shelters and also communications trenches. The average fighting position that was encountered by Soviet troops was 2 meters by 3 meters, so it was 6 feet by 9 feet, covered in logs, with a meter and a half of dirt and rocks over the top of the log. So four and a half feet roughly of dirt and, and uh, rocks over the top of the logs. So you have a cover that's probably close to two meters thick, so about six feet deep. This is a well-protected position that would protect it from artillery fire and uh, air-delivered fire from aircraft either fixed wing or helicopters in uh, this time period hind gunships. Redundancy was always a high priority. The defense that was conducted was an active area defense with mobile maneuver forces to support, reinforce, and recapture needed strong points and these counterattacks were launched from multiple directions by small groups. The needed strong points would be strong points that if they were lo lost, it meant that the other positions nearby were in danger of falling quickly also. A central reserve force was held back from the fighting and was only committed to reinforce critical locations at critical times during the battle. If it looked like the enemy was going to make a penetration through the defense that endangered the entire area, then that reserve force would be committed. If they lost a major location, say a supply dump, a major uh, defense point, then the uh, reserve would be committed. The defending force regularly rehearsed battle drills to include occupying positions quickly, defending the positions, supporting other positions, and counterattacking. The anti-armor teams employed RPGs. There was anti-tank guided missiles that was provided primarily Milan's, but their primary uh, anti-tank weapon was the RPG which the teams employed at a distance of 20 to 30 meters from the armor, so they were very close when they fired. They did it so that they were out of line of sight of the crew and they would attack from multiple directions at the same time so that the enemy never really knew where the fire was coming from. The enemy is, uh, the Mujahideen gunners are so close the crew can't really respond with the coaxial machine guns or the roof mounted 12.7 uh, millimeters. Air defense was, was primarily employed in a crossfire mode with the weapons being heavy machine guns firing preferably from above. Later in the war around 1987 Large numbers of Stingers and Red Eye missiles were smuggled into Afghanistan. These were employed by primarily mobile teams who would get posted on ridges and hilltops. Once the uh, 
stingers and the red eyes were appearing in large numbers on the battlefield, then the Soviets had to start flying higher, which meant that their uh, delivered munitions from aircraft became even more inaccurate. Now there was a note in there that if an area did not see much activity or was thought to be 100% secure, the Mujahideen units in the area would become extremely lax on basic security measures. They would not even prepare defenses. They would not do any rehearsals for how to react if an enemy were to attack. And the, those particular areas did end up getting hit by Soviet Special Operations troops and Helleborn troops. They would pick an area that the Spetsnaz would uh, recon. They'd find out, hey, these guys over here are really sloughing off. We got a supply depot here, or this is a major point on their supply route. We can take this out and we can interdict, interdict their supply lines. Then you would have helicopter troops that would be brought in or other Spetsnaz units that would be brought in. They would attack the area and the Mujahideen would literally be caught in bed. No way to defend themselves, no idea what they're doing. Now the example I have here is basically an area where they were expecting attacks into and they had prepared for it putting in fighting positions, trenches, bunkers, which is what these rectangular areas are. We also have on here right now four AAA positions, automatic anti-aircraft. These would be heavy machine gun. The, uh, from what I've seen in pictures, this would be 12.7 millimeters, 14.5 millimeters, and 23 millimeter. Those were the most common weapon systems employed by the Afghans against the Soviet troops. Some of them would be brought in from the outside, smuggled in, while most of them would be ones that would be captured or bought from the uh, Soviet or their uh, Afghan uh, lackeys. So we have our positions. We have our village here, which is in Mujahideen hands. We access our positions through concealed routes. Coming from the side up here, up onto the side of the hill. If you keep going up to the top of the hill, you get to this reserve position here. Skirt the ridge going this way. You come to this line of uh, positions here. You have a quick trail that comes down as an additional way to reinforce this position here. You also have a split off here from this intersection going up here to this level to the anti-aircraft positions and the reserve position here. Continue along the ridge. You get to the rest of the trenches that are in here. This one on this side come in from over here up to the back side. You split off on the front of the ridge to these two positions. Continue along the back side. You can come in over the top to this anti-aircraft position which has a concealed trail coming down to this trench here so you can reinforce in here or it's a potential escape route. Continue along. You have a split off to this anti-aircraft position. Swing around the front concealed to this trench. How it's set up, this position reinforces this one, this one reinforces this one, and if the enemy makes it back this far, they get fired from three directions, from the front and the flanks. Any aircraft are set up, this position is crossed from this position, this position is crossed from this position. And then potentially you would have mobile stinger or man pad teams, one located up in here, Another one back in here somewhere. And once the battle would begin, you would have reinforcements that would come in from farther back in the valley, rally up here on the village or nearby, 
wherever the Mujahideen commander had his headquarters at, find out where they need to go, where they need to reinforce. Now, typically how the Soviets did their operations, they initially opened up with artillery or aircraft delivered munitions, rockets and bombs. The notes uh, stated that the Soviet fires, especially in the beginning, was really inaccurate. They were basically dumping ordnance and not getting much of an impact on the enemy for it. Mainly because any defenders that were in the area, as soon as they started hearing those rounds coming in, they, they seen the aircraft coming in, their observers noticed them. The warning went out. People got in those artillery proof shelters and waited for the barrage to pass. The ones that were outside the barrage occupied their positions. So the first fires that would come in would probably be this area up in here. Well, then these guys would start filling in the positions from here. The any aircraft, if they were not taking fire, would occupy their positions. As soon as uh, enemy helicopters, hind gunships, or SU-25 Frogfoot, uh, fixed wing uh, aircraft, their, uh, their, their counter to the A-10 Warthog. As soon as that aircraft would start swooping in, the anti-aircraft positions here would start engaging the targets and they would engage it in pairs, getting crossfire going in. As soon as the initial Soviet elements would start moving in, their uh, vanguard of the assault, these positions would then open up on them when they're inside the kill zone. RPGs fired down from above or potentially fired from ground level from spider holes or concealed uh, bunkers off on the side in little nooks that the enemy didn't know about fire those RPGs into the side of the uh, armor that would be in front and the infantry fighting vehicles. Then they would start pouring in fire and grenades from above on the infantry as they started escaping the vehicles or as they dismounted to try to push along the sides to try clearing the defenses. If any particular position was lost a counterattack would be launched primarily with the forces that are in the immediate area. Multiple, it would be uh, multiple small teams. Say we lost this position here. Well, if we get a force that's still located up in here, our own little reserve, they can attack coming in from this direction and attack from this direction and pinch them right between while fire is being poured down on them from up here and potentially fire from over here. It's pretty straightforward, pretty effective. Uh, for those of you that have not looked into the Afghan war of the 1980s, uh, one person to look into is Ahmed Shah Massoud. Reportedly, one of the reasons he's so revered in Afghanistan even today is his tactical prowess. One of the things he did is he defended a valley against the Soviets from the start of the war to the end of the war. And from what I remember reading on it, his defense of that valley, he stopped no less than 23 major Soviet offensives to try to take that valley. And they never did. The farthest they got into the valley was only about a quarter to a half mile, I believe is what I had read. And that initial force was early in the war and they were wiped out quickly. And, you know, for 10 years after that, they weren't even able to advance that far into the valley ever again. So this is a way of defending an area with a smaller force that doesn't involve putting in massive fortifications like you've seen in World War I, just continuous trenches or massive belts of obstacles. Any obstacles that would be employed in this would be point obstacles, point minefields, 
maybe uh, dropping rocks or something from above on top of the enemy, creating roadblocks that way. You know, just some real basic stuff. Not a uh, really a defense in depth as we think of it in uh, Western military doctrine. Now for all my engineer brothers in the Patriot and Militia movements, always remember, essay ons.